welcome to Unapologetically Sensitive, where you can learn, relate, laugh, and maybe even live a bolder, brighter life. I'm your host, Patricia Young, licensed clinical social worker. This is a weekly podcast where we explore the strengths we have because of our sensitivity and some of the challenges it poses as well. The information in this podcast is not a substitute for help from a licensed mental health professional. Hey there, to the creatives, healers, sensitives, and deep thinkers. This is episode 20, part two on childhood emotional neglect. Today, we're back with Dr. Erica Martinez, where we're going to continue our discussion. We're going to be talking about Dr. Webb's article titled, Childhood Emotional Neglect Undermines the Highly Sensitive Person's Best Strengths. We're also going to be talking about vantage sensitivity, four types of attachment styles, some specific exercises from Dr. Webb's book, Running on Empty, There are a couple of things. In the background on Dr. Martinez's side, the air conditioning is running in and out. If you listen to the first episode, it's just a continuation, and I really didn't address it. I often have no control over the sound quality for our guests because I do remote interviews. We also talk about the question of, does childhood emotional neglect cause someone to be a highly sensitive person? And Dr. Martinez talks about some of the neurobiology that's involved. If you're a parent and you have kids, it's really hard sometimes to take this information in and then to not look at what we didn't get and then to see the reflection in how we may be parenting our kids. I'm going to hop on at the end of this because this has been going on for me as I'm listening to Dr. Webb's book, which I would highly recommend to anybody. It's very user-friendly and She gives so many concrete examples of the subtle ways that this stuff shows up. I would strongly recommend it. It's also available on Audible if you don't really like to sit and read, but you like to listen to stuff. So let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Martinez. Erica Martinez, PsyD, a Florida licensed psychologist and certified educator, specializes in the assessment and treatment of a variety of mental health conditions in young adults. Combining her expertise in neuropsychology, assessment, trauma, and shame resilience, she helps others explore life's challenging areas and brainstorm solutions using their personal strengths. Dr. Martinez provides therapy to high achievers, professional millennials, and entrepreneurs facing quarter-life crises, relationship meltdowns, and existential dilemmas which can present as a myriad of symptoms, including anxiety, destructive behaviors, self-sabotage, depression, loneliness, burnout, poor self-esteem, shame, and impaired social skills. Dr. Martinez is also a certified Daring Way facilitator, bringing the groundbreaking research and curriculum on vulnerability, courage, shame, and worthiness developed by Dr. Brene Brown to South Florida. Before we start, I just want to thank you so much for being a listener. The numbers are getting bigger. We're probably going to hit 10,000 downloads this month in March, and I'm really excited. I would love to hear from you. I've gotten some feedback about our episode on rejection sensitivity. I'm hearing that you're wanting another episode. So please send me your questions at unapologeticallysensitive at gmail.com. And as soon as I have enough questions, I'll reach out to Jared and have him come back to do another episode. And now, on to the show. Welcome back, Dr. Martinez. Thank you so much. Please call me Erica. Thank you. I meant to call you Dr. Martinez at the beginning of the last episode, and I totally forgot. If I ever got a PhD, my kids would call me Dr. Mommy, so I do want to give you a little respect for that. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Erica, I was Erica before I was doctor, so we're good. We've been talking about childhood emotional neglect. This is part two. So can we just do a brief recap of what is childhood emotional neglect and what would it look like if someone had experienced childhood emotional neglect? Sure. Childhood emotional neglect or CEN as you probably hear us call it is what failed to happen for you and to you while you were growing up. It means that you're Growing up, your parents did not really validate or address your emotions as a child. And there was this lack of parental emotional attunement and responsiveness. 
uh, while you were growing up. So that's in a nutshell what CEN is. Okay. And then in terms of you know what it might look like uh, as you've gotten older, you know, grown up, it might look like feeling empty inside, like there's this void, like there's something deeply wrong with you. That's often what people say. There's also difficulty with accepting or asking help, which is something called counterdependence. You also tend to have mm-hmm. this very unrealistic view of yourself or perspective about yourself. That's pretty common. There's a sense that you're deeply flawed or deeply unlovable. Like there's something really, really wrong with you and you can't name it. You can't quite put your finger on it. So most people with CEN, these are the things that they tend to say that are kind of common features that people experience. And they usually do come with anxiety and stress and burnout and depression as well. You know, I was reflecting as you were talking, and I didn't bring this up in the first episode, when we had talked about the th- or three types of parenting that impact CEN. Is that mm-hmm. a correct way to say it? Sure. Yeah. I think the I think the fourth one, and this is really key to the our listeners, is just having a parent who's not an HSP could be enough to have CEN. Well, I was going to say, yeah, that makes absolutely, you know, absolute sense. I think if you have a parent who is not an HSP, that they don't have that depth of processing that HSPs have, they might feel like they're responding well enough or good enough to their child's uh, emotional needs, when in fact, it really, to the HSP child, it really feels like it, it falls short. So yeah, that makes perfect sense. Right. And I can't tell you how many parents I've heard without knowing the traits of being an HSP. So if this creates wounding for any of my HSP listeners, I'm, I apologize in advance. But, you know, they'll talk about their kids as being needy or dramatic or, you know, having all these somatic complaints or not wanting to go and do things, just the challenges that they have. And then once they start learning about the HSP traits and learning about transitions and talking about feelings and all of those things, there starts to become a shift in the relationship. And some of these parents are therapists, they're educated people. And so I think sometimes when we think about CEN, it's really important to think about in terms of HSP children that all it takes, you could have very well-educated parents. They could even be therapists, but without knowing about being an HSP or CEN, I think that's enough to create a lot of the symptoms that we're talking about. Right. I think, you know, I think they kind of fall into that well-meaning parenting category, right? That, you know, they mean well, they, they do the best they can by their kids. They provide a roof, clothes on their back, food on the table, but you don't know what you don't know. And so, as you said, you could have really, really well-educated, well-informed parents that they just don't know about this information. They don't know about HSP. They don't know about CE. And it takes them exploring and trying to understand why their child is quote unquote needy or clingy or struggles with transitions that when they start learning, they, they uncover this world of research. That's the thing too, Patricia, about our field, like it's ever changing, it's ever growing. And it's so broad. It's and there's so much to learn that you can't know everything. And so you as a parent, you you kind of also have to have some self compassion for yourself, right? And know that there are things that you can do once you do uncover the information to improve the relationship with your child. And that's really important. Sure. I know sometimes I come off as being judgy and critical, and especially when it comes to therapists, because I'm I'm working through some of my own junk. Some of you guys know it. So if that comes across, I apologize. I own it. And I'm human. (laughs) I wouldn't have interpreted it that way. But you know what? I'm right there with you. I very, I have, I struggle with befriending. And it's something I myself am working on a lot this year, befriending other therapists, because I don't necessarily vibe with them. (laughs) I don't necessarily connect with a lot of them. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of judgment. And I said to you off off the call, I think it's especially true in in the PhD, PsyD doctoral world, where, you know, all of a sudden you have this extra letter behind your name and 
something's supposed to change magically <laughs> when the expectations are different. So I totally resonate with you on that front. Right. And everybody needs to do what works for them. And depending on your field and your orientation and who you work with, I, I get that. And what I know for me, working with highly sensitive people, people that are perfectionistic, people that have strong feelings, people that are very self-critical, they want to have relationships with other mm -hmm. human beings that also have imperfections and are willing to share some of that without taking away from their therapy. It's so incredibly healing and powerful when you are working with a therapist who is right there with you and not better than you or above you or there's not that power differential. I'm on my soapbox. I'm getting off. But if you have anything to say, I'm, no, I'm happy to listen. No, I think that's incredibly <laughs> true. Uh, and I find, and I, I think I had to learn that the hard way because, you know, I think that when we go to graduate school, I've always said this and I'll probably get burned alive at the stake for this, but I think, you know, a lot of graduate school beat the good clinician out of me with a lot of fear based information and um, I've had to slowly kind of find my way back to, to the things that made me a good clinician. Part of that process has also been realizing that that power differential, that blank slate that they kind of teach you to be when you're doing therapy in graduate school, it just it doesn't work anymore. And people are going to start to really, really realize that it's not working and it won't continue to work as this millennial generation gets a little bit older and we start to have more and more and more of them come into therapy to work with us in the field, they don't stand for it. They don't want you to be the sage on the yeah. stage, so to speak. They want you to be at their level and they want to work collaboratively and they want you to be real with them. I, I completely yeah. understand and I agree with you on that front. So good soapbox. Thank you. And and I will say that if you have a therapist who is talking about themselves during the session, if they're having emotions and you're having to tend to their needs, if they have a need to relate to everything that you're saying and it's not helpful for your process, this is not what I'm talking about. And if that's going on, then there's something wrong in your relationship. So that's all I'm going to say about yeah. self-disclosure should always <laughs> be an aid of the client. Right. To create connection and bring it back to the client and then focus on what the client is experiencing. It's not for the benefit of the therapist exactly. to talk about everything and how they relate. That is not the goal exactly. of self-disclosure. Shifting a little bit, Dr. Webb wrote an article called How Childhood Emotional Neglect Undermines the Highly Sensitive Person's Three Greatest Strengths. And I just want to review really briefly about this, and then we're going to move forward. The first strength that Dr. Webb talks about is you feel things deeply and powerfully. And what she says is that when you grow up emotionally neglected, you learn that your emotions are useless and you should be ignored and hidden. So you're not being seen. This takes your powerful force from within, disempowers it, and then you end up having shame for being wired for exactly how you are because nobody can acknowledge this great strength that you have. Right. It, and you know what? It makes sense that this is what happens for HSPs that they bury it in this very important way of being that they're just biologically wired for is kind of repressed. And in the research, it's an adaptive response to the situation so that they can make it through the situation that they find themselves in, particularly, you know, whatever particular kind of uh, household they grew up in where the CN happened. It's an adaptive response. It's just, as I tell my clients, it was adaptive back then. It's not necessarily adaptive anymore nowadays. So it's important to figure out, like, how do we move forward? How do you want to move forward in being in the world? How do you want to let your emotions manifest and show up in a way that feels true and authentic to you? Right. The second strength is you're a deep thinker who needs to have meaning and purpose in your life. The message that you get from CEN is that your feelings don't matter. Then you internalize an even more painful message. Since your emotions are the most deeply personal expression of who you are, it's natural for you to end up feeling like I don't matter. And I've talked about this before of how we have that need to who I am matters, what I feel matters, what I think matters. I need to be seen. I need to be heard and validated. So then we end up feeling less important than other people, and that undermines 
the ability to experience yourself and your life is meaningful and important. Right. Probably a lot of HSPs listening to this will this will resonate a lot with them. You know, I think this is where that unrealistic self-appraisal characteristic comes in. And, and it's also where I feel that the uh, that critical voice in your head, the critic that lives in there, that's really where it comes mm-hmm. from, is that you've internalized this message that you don't matter, that you're not important. And then that voice that you've internalized, which is the really, I mean, that's what happens is that you internalize your parents' voice. And then eventually that it becomes, when as you're older, it becomes to sound like your own. And in, in the case of parents, uh, of children who grew up with parents that led to them being CEN, the lack of message is just as resounding as if there were to have been a message, if that makes sense. Yep. Yep. This is probably going to go over the heads of most of the listeners, unless anybody's my age and liked Woody Allen. But there's a very old movie called Take the Money and Run. And in it, Woody Allen plays his character with the black rimmed glasses. And these bullies would always come up and grab his glasses, take them off and smash them. And then it gets to the point where he sees the bullies coming. He takes off his own glasses and he smashes them. And that is such a beautiful illustration for what we do to ourselves that we get the message that who we are isn't okay, our feelings aren't okay, our thoughts aren't okay. And we internalize that. And then that's what we end up recreating in relationships that we internalize those messages, which is why I love talking about gremlins. Because when we've internalized that, it feels like it's who we are, that core of shame that who we are is fundamentally wrong and flawed. And when we can start naming gremlins, create some space and separation from who we are to what I call gremlins. So then we can start looking at the gremlins and there's a separation right, of self. Right. That's exactly right. Yeah. It's funny you brought up Woody Allen. I, when I think of that, I think of Charlie Brown and how Lucy is so mean to him. Um, and, and, you mm-hmm. know, he just sometimes kind of anticipates she's going to remove the football. So he just kind of gives up and off, you know, so it made me think of it. Mm -hmm. Right. It's that learned helplessness. If I'm not going to get my needs met, then what's the point of trying? Yeah. Yeah. The third one is your intense feelings and your need to have meaning and purpose in your life both make your relationships heartfelt and genuine. But if you don't have that in your relationships growing up, you miss the opportunity to learn how to understand and manage your emotions and the emotions of others which kind of ties back to what we were talking about at the end of our last session is healing takes place in relationships that we can do as much reading on our own, but it's really when we're in relationships with others that are healthy and can not take on our stuff and can really be there for us that we get a chance to have those painful things come up. We're seen, we're heard, we're validated and we're mirrored positively and we get to heal. Right. And and I'll say it again. I said it in the last interview we get hurt in those re- in relationships but we can also as you said heal in relationships and i often find that for cen people and, and probably even more so for the hsps that have cen as well if there might be a a tendency to not want to be in relationship that they realize they were hurt in relationship and so they don't want to <laughs> be in relationship and they avoid relationships and they kind of shut down. Or if they are in relationships, they put their needs and their emotions on the back burner all the time. And they are they start to be a caregiver all the time or a people pleaser or perfectionistic because they're looking for this external validation because they can't supply internal validation to themselves. Right. And it's also how you get a sense of connection. And there's less chance of abandonment or loss. If I'm the one in the relationship who's providing care and nurturing, now I've secured a place in the relationship. And then you appreciate that you mirror that back to me and I feel loved and appreciated. But that fear of if I have any needs or if I have conflict, I may lose the relationship because of that. So it makes it tenuous, but we don't know any better. And what you just described just then becomes the cycle of codependency. Mm Hmm you're only okay if the other person's okay. Right. And I think that there's a fine line there with being a highly sensitive person. So 
I always feel very protective of my HSP listeners because we are caring and we are attuned and it is part of our strength. It's on a continuum. Naturally, HSPs are going to be tuned into what's going to make the other person feel comfortable and what do they need. And it, it really is a strength. If it's becoming detrimental, then we may want to take a look at that. But I, I'm always protective Absolutely. of my HSP because we hear about something and we're like, yeah. that's me. No, you know, I, I know that <laughs> HSPs do tend to be very nurturing and, and very caregiving by default. That's just the way HSPs are wired. When those positives, those attributes, become negative in the sense of like you lose yourself in relationship because if you don't the relationship is not okay if that person's not okay then you're not okay and you lose your sense of self in that way then that's where it can be detrimental but caregiving in a healthy way is a wonderful and it's a great superpower to have yeah and i don't think that relationships are 50 50 sometimes it's 90 10 one way sometimes it's 10 yeah. 90 the other way so it's not that relationships have to be 50 50 sometimes we show up more than the other person does and then at other times the other person shows up more than we do but i think if there's that reciprocity mm -hmm. that's generally a good gauge too to see meaning that if both people are giving and taking it probably is more likely to be a healthy balanced relationship as opposed to someone who's just always giving and really not receiving much right. from the relationship. It's that balance. I have a question for you. I've heard this posed an awful lot where many people think that CEN caused them to be an HSP. Do you have any feelings about that? CEN causing them to be highly sensitive. The premise is that I had to tippy toe around in my house. I had to be extra sensitive. I had to be able to read cues. I had to know what was going on. I had to respond because the environment didn't support me. So CEN caused me to be a highly sensitive person. My understanding of highly sensitive people is that they are biologically wired this way. Their central nervous system, their peripheral nervous system is wired and made in a very particular way that allows them to deeply experience sensory input through their sensory organs. As for CEN causing someone to be HSP, that doesn't make sense to me from a neurobiological perspective. I think what fits better there is that people in CEN settings and households develop certain coping mechanisms where they mean they learned to be sensitive and attentive and attuned to the, the people in their household so that they could get their needs met in that way because it was the only way they were going to get their needs met. So I think it's an adaptive skill. Uh, it's a coping mechanism that, uh, that probably makes them resilient and not so much HSP. I mean, if you look at the literature, this is what the HSP literature and research tells us is it's called vantage resistance, vantage sensitivity in HSPs. Whereas, you know, if you're not an HSP, you're going to learn these coping mechanisms because children are incredibly adaptive. So, Yeah, yeah. Can you say a little bit more about vantage sensitivity? Why it's an advantage for Gosh, HSP? Yeah, absolutely. This is so fascinating to me because I'm a neuropsychologist by training. So when I went into the research and I, and I looked at all this stuff, I was like a kid in a candy shop. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and I think I told you off air that it has sparked such a, such a beautiful conversation between uh, myself and my father, who is also a therapist and also a neuropsychologist. So yeah, thank you for, for putting us on that path. But yeah, so, so vantage sensitivity is that because HSPs are wired biologically to feel more and, and to sense more subtlety in their environments, good environments and healthy environments, instead of having positive outcomes, HSPs are going to have extra positive outcomes. Like they're going to thrive even more than a non-HSP would in a good environment. But the flip side of that coin 
is that in adverse environments or conditions like a CEN household, for example, they can also then have extra negative outcomes, which leaves them more vulnerable to finding themselves in situations where they might kind of get into unhealthy behaviors, hang out with unhealthy people who are not good for them, and just negative outcomes. Whereas there may be HSPs then that that because they find themselves in this environment where their emotions are not being addressed or validated, what they do is that they develop these coping mechanisms to push down and bury their emotional world because it doesn't fit in the household that they're growing up in. And in that sense, it kind of dims their their processing. It's think of it like a dimmer switch on um, lights. They become adaptive to the circumstances in their household and it makes them less less vulnerable in terms of outcomes, of course, to that environment. But what com- but it comes at the expense of their HSP gifts, which is really what Dr. Webb is talking about in this article that we're that we're referring to. So the takeaway that I get from that, the bad news is it's going to be much harder for HSPs who grow up in CEN households because if we're in a positive environment, we thrive. And if we're not in a positive nurturing environment, we don't do as well. However, once we have the ability to surround ourselves in environments that work for us, our capacity to heal and to change and to grow far outweighs those of the non-HSPs. So it's kind of a mixed bag, a good news, bad news type of thing. Yeah, it's like really, really good news and really, really bad news. But once you're ready to heal, it's really, really good news. (laughs) Yeah. And Dr. Aaron's research shows that Mm -hmm. those HSPs that grew up in households where the caregivers were not responsive, so this could be CEN, Mm -hmm. have higher rates of anxiety and depression. But again, and I'm not arguing whether anxiety and depression are biological or we need medication. I'm I'm not addressing any of that. What I can tell you is I've seen a number of HSPs that have anxiety and depression. And once they do healing work and they understand what their strengths are, they understand what happened in childhood, those symptoms really shift. If you do healing work and you still have anxiety and depression, there's nothing wrong. I'm, I really want to be clear. I'm not saying that it's a good, bad thing. I'm just wanting to provide another perspective that when who we are is thinking, feeling people, and that gets shut down, that shuts down our life, our life force as an HSP. Yeah. yeah, And I think that's really important. I don't know if you find that with your clients, but I certainly find with my clients that are probably highly sensitive and also grew up with CEN what I find is that they've been through therapy and they're, they'll literally say to me, you're my last ditch effort. If therapy with you doesn't work, like I'm throwing my hands up in the air because I've been through, they'll tell me any number of therapists. And what I find is that if you, as therapists, if you try to throw the traditional interventions, which is cognitive behavior therapy, that's only going to get you at these kinds of clients that's only going to get you so far. It's still going to leave these clients feeling unfulfilled, like therapy was somewhat effective, but not completely effective. So their their therapeutic experience is going to be very meh or wah, wah. it's not, they're not going to be very excited about the therapeutic process or, or they'll come in and say, oh yeah, I have really treatment resistant depression or treatment resistant anxiety. When in fact, what it is, is, is this kind of attachment trauma situation that happens with CEN, you know? So that's my personal experience with, with the kinds of clients that I happen to work with. Something so important that you you made me think of it as you were speaking, you know, I think it's Brene Brown who says, we are feeling beings that think, Mm -hmm. not thinking beings that feel. So I think that's yeah. an important thing to remember too. Yeah. I want to move forward, but I have a lingering thought from what we were talking about. It was a while back, but there's just so much great stuff in this conversation. <laughs> Before I knew about being an HSP, my personal theory was I learned to be tuned in because it was a survival instinct in my household. Once I learned I was an HSP, 
I too believe that these are innate traits. And I think that being an HSP may create, even if we have depression and anxiety, we're tuned in enough to figure out what we need to do to adapt to make the best of a really lousy situation. Absolutely. Yes. And that's the that's the part of Dr. Aaron's research that I believe she calls it vantage resistance. And it's kind of like what we were talking about, which is the the way that HSPs are wired, it's biological, it's literally genetic. That only makes up so much of us, right? We know from epigenetics, we know from the research that the brain is neuroplastic, the brain does change. I think what happens to people, as you said, that when you were growing up, that you develop these adaptive ways of coping, that is resilience. But the cost of resilience is the loss of connection with your emotional world. It doesn't mean that you lose your your HSP-ness, so to speak. It just means that the environment shapes you and changes you. But it's something that once you start to heal, you can reconnect with and reaccess. Yeah, yeah. You started to talk about attachment styles. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So, you know, what happens when parents don't really respond to their children in a way that is healthy and supportive what often happens is that we find various kinds of insecure attachments develop. And there's four different kinds of attachment. The, the one that most people deem as good and healthy and they kind of strive for is the secure attachment. Um, and that's what we would see with people who don't have C8 men, right? Or ideally, that's what we would, we would imagine seeing. But for people with C8 men, they probably fall into one of the other three insecure styles. And there's three different insecure styles. There's the dismissive kind. Sometimes you'll see it in the in the research called dismissive avoidant. There's the, and so dismissive, these are the kinds of people that tend to shut down. They're not, they don't connect. They stay away from people. They don't seek out relationships. That's how it might look like. The anxious preoccupied is, is another type of insecure attachment style that we might see, you know, in someone, this might look like they're very worried about being in a relationship. For example, they're very worried about their partner. Are you okay? Are you not okay? What do you need? You know, is it okay if I do this? Is it okay if I do that? There's a lot of, for these people, there's a lot of rumination and just racing thoughts constantly in their heads. Uh, And so they do tend to demonstrate or, or, or verbalize anxiety when they come in to work with us in therapy. And then there's the fearful avoidant. And the fearful avoidant style is is really interesting. And it's really interesting, especially when people are dating, I find, because it's kind of this, they seek out relationships and then they run away from relationships. They seek out relationships and they run away from relationships. It's kind of this yo-yoing back and forth, back and forth. I want to be with you. No, I don't want to be with you. For people who uh, who do not have CEN can be really confusing or people who have a secure attachment can be really, really confusing to them because there's a lot of, of shifting emotionality there. Yeah, yeah. I really think that At their core, if you take away all the fear and the defenses, I think we all have that need to connect, to be seen, to know that we matter, to know that we belong. But all of these attachment injuries get in the way. And especially if you've got CEN and then we keep recreating these relationships that don't work, it can just reinforce it to the point that we believe that people are actually bad and out to hurt us. And it may be that we create relationships with people that do that but we don't have that fresh lens of knowing, let me get more information. What am I doing? That there's a whole different way of doing relationships, but sometimes people don't even have that awareness because of all of the attachment injuries. You're exactly right. And you know, what happens with these attachment injuries is that because there is a lot of shame as part of uh, what happens with CEN and as well with HSPs is that they develop these mechanisms of coping with and dealing with what they're experiencing in relationship to other people. 
especially if they get activated or triggered. And these are called shame shields. And this comes out of the research from Dr. Brene Brown. There's three different kinds. You'll either move towards people. And those will t- probably be the anxious, preoccupied type that will tend to be perfectionistic and people pleasing. Uh, you might move away from people. That means you withdraw. And so that'll be the, the dismissive attachment style. Or you might move against people. And I can certainly see the dismissive or the fearful avoidant attachment styles uh, moving against people, being aggressive, or maybe even passive aggressive in relationships as well. So I think that's important to know. Can we put some examples with those? I just know that theories are easy to talk about, but for me, it's like, I always want to know, what does that look like? How would that show up in a relationship? (laughs) So sure. For example, let's say somebody's having an interpersonal conflict. And if so, if you tend to be dismissive, avoidant, and use the shame shield of moving away, you'll withdraw. You won't have a conversation. You'll literally walk away from the conversation. You will not engage. And that leaves the other person just kind of like, what What just happened here? Like, why won't you sit at the table and have this conversation with me? They just, they literally leave the table. So that's what that might look like. In the anxious, preoccupied type, their tendency is to use perfectionism and people pleasing. And so they'll try to make sure that everybody's okay, because the only way, if there is conflict, the only way that they feel okay is if everyone else around them is okay, right? There's that people pleasing as a means to resolving conflict instead of perhaps actually voicing what they're feeling, even if it might create more conflict or people might disagree with them. So that that's one way that might look. If they're perfectionistic, um, what they'll tend to do is that they'll try to get everything just right, just perfect so that nobody can criticize them so that there's no chink in the armor. So they can try to be so perfect and be so, there's no flaws. And that way they can't be hurt, but they're constantly ruminating. They're constantly hustling for, for that sense of being okay because they they deeply feel that they're not with, with the fearful avoidant, you know, these are the, these are the people that, that might act out. And, and and when I say act out, it, it can be aggressive or it can be passive aggressive. So sarcasm, underhanded comments, backhanded compliments are examples of that. Condescension is another example of that. I know I've certainly been guilty of that. Boy, if you ever triggered me and my younger self, I would have used the biggest words that I could think of to make you feel about two inches tall. So that's an example of what that might look like. Yeah, those are great. And what what I find often is with the anxious attachment, that if there's a rupture, if there's a conflict in the relationship, it is so hard to sit with the feeling of things not being okay, that you just want to keep getting back in there to try and fix it. Mm-hmm. If your partner or I see this with parenting as well, if your partner needs some time or some space away, that can create so much more anxiety in the anxious attachment, because you just want to get in there and do that repair work. And the other person may need time to just go off on their own, to heal, to get to a place where they can come back to the relationship. So often knowing what our attachment styles can really help when there is conflict, because all of these things are ways that we just, I mean, what's in my mind, what's under all of this is, am I okay? Do I belong? Do I matter? And and the ways that we respond when we're in conflict or with attachment is because we're trying to protect that and we either withdraw because it's too much or we feel like someone's going to see something about us. It's not okay. Or the perfectionism is to cover up. If you saw how flawed I was, you wouldn't love me. And the same thing with the aggressive is a way to kind of what I call, well, it's a Brene Brown term. We armor up. Right. So I'm feeling so vulnerable. So I'm going to puff up and be really big so that you can't hurt me. And I'm going to come at you with anger and with energy because that way you're not going to see how tender and vulnerable I am. Mm-hmm. It's the, the the dog that barks when they're yeah. injured, for example. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Okay, let's talk about what are some things. So if people identify with all this, what are some actual takeaways that people can start working on if they identify with all of this? Absolutely. So I'm not going to recreate the wheel. I'm going to kind of, from a macro level, run people through the steps that Dr. Webb outlines in her book. And I think the book is really powerful in the sense that it comes with very specific exercises and worksheets that you can photocopy. So I think those are helpful in this process. Now, why don't you say what the book is? Yeah. So there's two books. The first one is called Running on Empty, Overcome Your Childhood Emotional Neglect by Dr. Janice Webb. And that's really the first book that kind of started this all. She's got some great tips and tools and exercises that that you can put into practice just in your daily life that are really easy to put into practice. They're not easy to practice, but they're easy to interject into your life. I hope that makes sense. They're not obtrusive is what I mean. Mm-hmm. You can just make a photocopy of it or make your own version of it. And they're really, really helpful. I help use them with clients. And then the second book is called Running on Empty No More. And this is really, really powerful um, because it kind of walks you through the different kinds of relationships that are affected by CEN. So your relationship with your romantic partner, your relationship with your parents, and then your relationship with your own children. So each section of the book has its own set of processes and exercises with uh, worksheets that you can uh, access and put into practice to, to help heal those relationships as well. So it's, it's, I find it really helpful and really comprehensive. But I'll just briefly walk through pe- people through the, the steps that she outlines in the third part of the, the first book, Running on Empty. And the first step that she says is helpful is to understand the purpose and the value of emotions. People with CEN have something called alexithymia, which means that they don't understand emotion. They're like emotionally illiterate, so to speak, is probably the best way to to explain that. Some signs and some signals that might hint at the fact that you have this alexithymia is that you do tend to be irritable. Uh, you have this kind of mystified understanding or misunderstanding about other people's behavior, of your own behavior. If you do t- get angry, it tends to be really explosive and really, really big and disproportionate to the to the circumstance. Some people might say that your behavior is, is rash or impulsive. And also that you feel very fundamentally different and how you experience the world around you than, than what you see what you see in other people. So those are some some hints that you know you might have alexithymia. This is where it's important that you start to understand the purpose and the value of emotions and the role that they play in our worlds, not in our lives. And then once you start at that point, then the next step is just start being able to identify your own emotions. And she's got this great exercise where you record how you're feeling three times a day. And she gives a hand up for that. So starting to just become aware of, oh, I'm feeling something. What's that feeling called? And being able to, to identify the name of that feeling is really, really powerful. The third step she, she describes is monitoring your feelings, you know, how those feelings shift from day to day based on certain experiences throughout the day in response to maybe your workplace as opposed to your household. So just self-monitoring. And then the fourth step is beginning to accept and to trust your feelings. I think this is really, really powerful for HSPs because especially when they grow up in CEN households, you learn to not trust your feelings. You learn to, to, to that your feelings are wrong and that you shouldn't have them and that that makes you the odd one out in, in your household. Accepting and trusting your feelings is, is a powerful one step, I believe, for HSPs. And then learning to express yourself effectively. This is something that people with CEN are really, really challenged by because they've never really had a context to express themselves emotionally. They just had to suck it up and deal with it and move on and 
you know, especially for people who are resilient, they develop these other more, you know, also still socially acceptable ways of being that have worked for them. And, you know, at the surface don't seem maladaptive, but in fact really are. So learning to express yourself assertively, assertively and not aggressively or passive aggressively is really important. And then the sixth step is self-care, learning to nurture yourself. You mentioned earlier, understanding that sometimes people just need some time and space, even in the the midst of conflict, just to self-soothe. So self-soothing is really important. Practicing self-compassion, that's a really, that's a biggie. And then self-discipline. This this is one this is one that I find really really interesting is that people with CEN tend to towards excess or tend towards the absence of so they won't take care of their eating they won't do the things they know they need to do because they don't want to do it but they never internalize that parental message that well you don't like to do this but but it needs chewing. There's a lot of imbalance and, and lack of self-discipline with people that experience CEN and they'll often really berate themselves about it and they'll call themselves lazy and they'll call themselves procrastinators and all, kind, and all other name, kinds of names because they lack self-discipline and they, know, they had no place to learn it from because it wasn't modeled for them. So those are more or less the, the steps that she walks you through in, in healing. Wow, those are great. Those are great. What's your experience when you've worked with clients that are HSPs that have CEN? What kinds of outcomes do you tend to see? Well, it's kind of like that vantage sensitivity. Like once you you open up this world for them, it, it, they, it's like a fish to water. You know, <laughs> they just they kind of instinctually know what to do, and so in the right context, they do really, really, really well. And, and like you said, they show up ready to work. They show up to sessions on time. They're consistent with coming to sessions. And so their outcomes really reflect that. It, it's very encouraging, you know, very positive outcomes for HSPs when, when they come to therapy. Because like I said, I mean, this is, this is their natural habitat. Of course, they're going to thrive. So they do really well. Sure. That seventh one, it kind of hit me hard. I... <laughs> I kind of ran out of steam asking you questions because I started going in my head about where I see that showing up for me and where I see it showing up for my kids. So I, I kind of went down a little spiral rabbit hole for a few minutes there. So I'm, I'm just telling on myself, which is what we're really good at doing. <laughs> yeah. You, you mean the, the self-discipline one? Yeah, that one's hard. <laughs> yeah. I, get, I can see it for myself on both sides. And it's just an area where I continue to struggle. And I often talk about how I know that structure works really well for me. Like I need to have enough structure without having it be rigid, but man, that that (laughs) is just such a hard one for me. And I I really, I don't like admitting it. Yeah. I, I I feel you on that. I'm, I'm laughing, but it's, it's knowing laughter. (laughs) Okay. So please don't misinterpret it. It's Um, painfully identifying laughter. Yes. Yes. (laughs) Um, You know, for me, I call it organized chaos. I need a little bit of mess, but I, but, but there's a method in my madness to my mess. And, and what I've learned is that, and that might be different for you, too much structure doesn't work for me. So what I need to do is that I need to do one thing very intensely. And so I'll batch things and then I'll set it and forget it. And as long as I, I can do that to most things, so I'm really good with like systems and processes. Because of this self-discipline, I've developed this other mechanism of batching tasks. You've got to find what works for you. If I had to do something consistently every single day, like I'd want to gouge my eyes out. I'd be so like, that would be really painful to me. But if I can do one thing and do it really well for, and have it work for a long period of time, that I'm okay with. I'm okay with like revisiting it once a month or what have you. It's probably why yeah. I don't have a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I know one of my fears before starting was like, am I going to be able to do it? And am I going to stick with it? Because it's not uncommon for me. I I think I'm, I had a guest that used this term and it really stuck. It's like, I'm a visionary that I'm great with the ideas, but often what it takes to follow through with things is it's just, it's menial. I, I think I may have some ADHD. So having to follow through and do tasks can really be a challenge so far. So good. So I have over 50 episodes I've released, so I must be doing something right. (laughs) 
yes, your system must be working. Whereas <laughs> with me, I'm not a visionary at all that being a visionary kind of makes me uncomfortable. Like I can't really wrap my head around it, but Mm -hmm. boy, you tell me what your vision is and I can execute. Now, once I execute, I don't want to go back to it. Like we're done, put the system, Uh put the system into operation and let's move on. (laughs) Let's do something different. Let's be friends. Yeah. Oh, there you go. (laughs) Let's be friends. You you dream it up and I'll help you figure it out. I know with one of my sons, I've joked, it's like, he really needs to have a partner who's got really good executive functioning, because it's just not his strength. So I think that when we can find folks that, and my husband is also very good at this, that, you know, there are certain things that he's so good at that are just not my strength. So I think when we know what our strengths are, and where we need some help, if we can pair up with someone, it does help. Yeah, my husband's (laughs) definitely the visionary. He sees the global stuff. And then I'm the one in the background, like, I feel like the critical, like negative Nelly. Because I'm mm. the one sitting there saying, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah. but how are you going to do this? So, and we both run businesses. So that's, those are fun conversations. Yeah, I bet. I bet. Erica, is there anything else that you want to bring up about CEN or HSPs that we haven't talked about? Because we're needing to wrap up, but I just want to see if there's anything else that you want to bring up. You know, I think we, we've covered a lot of it. I can't say more to encourage people to seek out support and and find what works for you. It doesn't have to be what works for everybody else, but find your special unique recipe of what makes you feel good. There is ways to heal and to live a very happy, rewarding and enriched life, both as a CEN person and, and as an HSP. I can't stress that enough. I think it's important that people really have a sense that there is hope to all of this. And, and I would also encourage them to look in because shame is such a big part of the lives of HSPs and of people with C and I would really encourage them as well to, to look into the work of Dr. Brene Brown. And she has this, she has several books and she has the Ted talks that uh, people can see but she um, she's taken her books, Daring Greatly and Rising Strong and Gifts of Imperfection. And what she's done is that she's operationalized them and she's turned them into curriculums that now people like myself that are certified facilitators of her work, we are facilitating and putting that information out into the world. And that really, really is so healing. Like if you, if, even if you don't pick up the books by Dr. Webb and you don't read through them and you don't do those exercises, if you go to one of these three day intensives of the daring way, or even a one day, it's so powerful. I mean, it's, it's really transformative and it really disrupts the CEN cycle so that you don't keep transferring this down generation, down generation, and you can really be that agent of change. So I think that's really important for people to know. Yeah, so much of my orientation in therapy is really based on Dr. Brown's work just because I love what she does and it resonates so much with me. I will post some links to a few of her TED Talks and things that are relevant and the books that we've talked about in the show notes just because I think that what she does is so incredibly powerful and so much of what goes on with CEN and with being an HSP centers around shame. So being able to address that shame is just really important. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And if people go to Dr. Webb's website, she has lists of therapists that are familiar with CEN. I would encourage you to be mindful that if you are an HSP, that you want to make sure that you have a therapist that is HSP knowledgeable as well. Dr. Aaron's website has a list of HSP knowledgeable therapists, but the CEN and HSP haven't been married yet. So you just want to be mindful if you are going to look for a therapist that they are aware of both of those, if that resonates with you so that you really get the best treatment, because it is going to be different if you are an HSP trying to get help for CEN. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I did look through the lists and I mean, there's, there tends to be always somebody in most states, but sometimes there's not a lot of people in your states, or if you're listening to this internationally, and maybe in your own country, if somebody is in your state, but not in your home, in your hometown, consider telehealth. So online therapy as, as an option, if that's appropriate internationally, 
that's a little bit more challenging. But in some instances, people can work with you remotely via online therapy as well if it's appropriate in your in, in your case. So I just want you to everyone to know that there are resources, there are things that you can do and ways to connect with therapists. I know the lists are not very robust, so I just want people to really know that. Yeah, yeah. Erica, where can people find you and what are your offerings? Yeah, so I'm always blogging about something and um, I'm a bookworm. So now I'm integrating a lot of book reviews that I find helpful into my blog. And uh, my blogs are taking a more personal tone. I'm also a certified Daring Way facilitator. So in, literally in a week on the 23rd of, of February, I will be um, hosting a Daring Greatly workshop facilitating the work of Dr. Brené Brown. I'm excited for that. That's great. And what what's your website where people can find you at? Sure. So it's envisionwellness.co, E-N-V-I-S-I-O-N-W-E-L-L-N-S-S dot C-O. You know, you can see the blog is on there. And you can also click on the social media links there at the top and, and find my, connect with me on social media. Okay, great. Is there anything else before we go? No, I think we covered a lot of ground here, Patricia. I'm excited. We did. Me too. I am so grateful that you were willing to come on and share your knowledge with us because I think this is going to be a really powerful episode for folks to listen to. Yeah, absolutely. I'm honored to to have been asked and it's been an absolute pleasure. All right. Thank you so much, Erica. I really appreciate it. Have a great day. You're welcome. You as well. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to the show. I don't know about you, but I have found this stuff on childhood emotional neglect incredibly fascinating. Oftentimes when I learn about a new subject or a tool, all of a sudden that's the lens that I'm seeing everything through. And as I'm listening to Dr. Webb's book, it's really interesting. At the beginning, I talked about If you're a parent and you're parenting your children, chances are you've made conscious choices on how you want to do it differently if you experienced childhood emotional neglect, whether you knew that that's what it was called or not. That was my experience. Now that my kids are 18 and off in college and I'm listening to this, I can really see how my struggles with self-discipline, just certain things are really a challenge for me and I can see how I struggle with that skill and I really didn't teach it to my kids because I just didn't have it. So I reached out to both of the boys the other day over video and just talked about the skills that I see that I'm lacking. And I talked to each of them individually to tell them where it looks like to me, not having this skill is showing up in their lives. I apologized and, you know, I said I did the best that I could and then gave them some options if they feel like they need tutoring at college to help them, if they want to get some coaching, if they want to get some therapy. I'm really open to it. And I also gave them the the option, just creating the opportunity to talk about, if you guys have any feelings about this, you can always come and talk to me. It won't hurt my feelings. I'm strong. I can handle it. I think that that's the best gift that we can give our kids that we're going to make mistakes. I don't care how great of a parent we are, but giving them the language and because childhood emotional neglect is about what didn't happen, they may not have the awareness that it's something that they didn't get. And they also may not know that their feelings of not wanting to get stuff done, having a hard time with discipline, having a hard time initiating things is because of the skill that I didn't teach them. What Dr. Webb talks about is we often end up feeling like we're lazy or we're not motivated or there's something wrong with us. And our parents were very loving and caring, but they weren't able to attune to our emotional needs. And, you know, in my case, I think in some ways I was a little permissive with the kids and did not push them to do some things that I think would have built some skills that are just really good to have as an adult. So the best thing I can do now that they're grown is to let them know what those deficits are in my estimation, have it be okay for them to talk about it, to bring it into their awareness and give them some options. They're kind of adults now, so they get to choose how they want to move forward. So I think that those are the ways that we can address the mistakes or shortcomings that we've had or where our neglect shows up in our parenting. 
My point is, if you're a parent, my hope is that you find gentleness and compassion for yourself. We do the best that we can. Chances are you're choosing to parent very differently if you are a parent than you were parented. And no matter what, we're going to make mistakes. And the best thing we can do with our kids is to show how you fix mistakes, how we parent imperfectly. Changing gears. If any of this has brought up issues for you, now you have some things that you may want to look at, you're struggling with relationships, you can see some of your attachment styles, and you're wanting a little bit of extra help, I provide online telehealth to people in California. We meet on a platform that's similar to Skype, but it's private. And I offer a free 20-minute consultation where we can jump on a call online so you can get a chance to see what it's like. You can talk to me. We can talk about your goals. No obligation at all. Reaching out for therapy can be really challenging and having a really good fit with your therapist is the most important thing. So if you're interested, you can go to Patricia Young, lcsw.com. All of my contact information is there. All the places you can find me on social media are there. We do have an amazing Facebook group called Unapologetically Sensitive. Thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate each and every one of you. You have made this podcast a success, and I am so appreciative and so grateful. Remember, Sensitivity is nothing to apologize for. It's our superpower. Have a blessed day. Thank you.